people connect with Jesus, uh, they begin to change from the inside out and they begin to bear fruit and not just sort of your I'm a good person fruit or I prosper fruit, 
but you begin to change from the inside out in significant ways. Uh, you begin to love people that you didn't love before. You're able to forgive people that you didn't feel like you could forgive before. Uh, your attitude about life begins to change over time. And when those sort of things start coming out of us, what the Bible describes as fruit of the Spirit, being connected to God, love, joy, patience. When those things start coming out of us, we believe that as a community, uh, we begin to affect Brazelton, where we live. And the area where we live begins to change. It begins to rest in Jesus. It begins to rejoice in Jesus. It begins to reconcile in Jesus. And so we have, a, we have a big vision for what we want to try to accomplish, but it begins with just one small word, which is to abide in Jesus. And that's what we're going to do today as we come to worship him together. Um, I have a few announcements for you before we start, and then we're going to jump into our worship time. Uh, the first is after we're done here, each week we have a, a short fellowship time. So please, outside these doors, you'll see there's some drinks for you where you can grab a drink. We can hang out and talk to each other afterwards. Um, secondly, this week, if you're new and you've been visiting us for a while or if this is your first week, I want to encourage you to come to a newcomer's dessert that will be at our house uh, this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. It's just one hour from 7 to 8 if you're interested in coming to that, you can, uh, you can find out more information on our website, which is on the back of the bulletin as well. It'll tell you how to get to my house and a little bit more about what we're going to be doing there. It's basically going to be a time for us to hang out and for you to have any questions that you'd like to know more about the church to be answered for you while we're there. Child care is provided, but if you need child care, please contact me in the next couple of days and let me know so that we can make arrangements for that. Um, next week... Uh, we're going to have some really fun things happening at the church. We're going to have a number of people joining the church, but we're also going to have some baptisms next week. So uh, please uh, pray for us during that time. We'll have a special little party afterwards for those being baptized and, and for those who are becoming new members. So please uh, make a point to join us for that. Last thing that's important for you to know is that we're moving. Uh, we're going to move from this building to the venue at Friendship Springs on June the 13th. And we'll also shift and start meeting in the mornings. So that'll be a big change for us. We've been prepping for that for a long time, and we're looking forward to that. It also is a great uh, on-ramp for you to invite people that may want to come and be a part of our church since we'll be shifting to the mornings starting on June the 13th. You can find out more information about that uh, upcoming in the emails that we send out. Also, it'll be on our website. Um, that being said, uh, if you will, let me pray for us, and then we'll begin our worship time. Uh, Father, uh, we are restless people. Restless hearts are within us. We want uh, you, but we look outside of you for peace and for joy, for enjoyment in our lives. I pray today that this time together would be one where we would recenter on you, that our hearts would refocus on you, that you would be at work in us, changing us, making us more what we're designed to be. And we pray that Jesus would be more famous because of our time together today. Help us to lift him up in our hearts as we worship you. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Please stand. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 34. It says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let us worship him. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, enlightened.
Grant us mercy. Come, O Redeemer, come. Grant us peace. Look now upon our need. Lord, be with us. Heal us and make us free. Come, O oh Redeemer, come, grant us mercy. Come, O oh Redeemer, come, grant us peace. In a few moments, our confession will be from Psalm 23 in his book, Union with Christ, Rankin Wilborn makes a distinction between union with Christ and our communion with God. Our union with Christ is fixed and unalterable. It is settled. It's as sure as Christ's grip on our lives and the promise he has made that nothing can snatch us out of his hand. But our communion with God does vary. It's possible for us to grieve the Holy Spirit by willfulness, unbelief, even misdirected loves. And so we come confessing. We come to our Heavenly Father not with timidity, um, not fearfully, but confidently because we are now, even now, forgiven. Our sins have been put away. We are now in God's sight accepted as though we'd never been guilty. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yet, we sin. But because we are so loved and safe, we don't want to give ourselves a pass to go on sinning or even grow lax. We acknowledge the gap between who we are. We are without blemish and free from accusation, but also acknowledge that still today sin so easily entangles us. And so our confession is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But Lord, we are consumed with wanting more. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. But Lord, other pastures seem greener. We try to quench our thirst in unsafe waters. We remain restless. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. O oh Lord, we often prefer to lead than to be led and think we know the way better than you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And yet, Lord, we do sometimes fear. Help us to abide in your presence and your comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Oh God, sometimes we refuse to sit down at your table. Forgive us and help us to receive the abundance of your protection and provision. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forgive us for doubting your goodness. Lead us to our eternal home. Let's confess silently to the Lord.
Father, thank you that you delight to hear us. You're not disappointed in us. You don't shake your head, but you welcome us with more love than we can imagine and restore that sweet communion with you. We give you thanks through Christ our Lord. Would you stand as we hear the assurance of pardon from 1 John 1, 5 through 7? God is light. In him is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That is the promise of God for us today. Rejoice in that good news. Let's sing together. Our prayers of the people today uh, is preceded by a verse from 1 Peter. It says in your bulletin 5.8, but it's actually 5.7, which was a good thing because it sent me back to the passage to, uh, to confirm, and I saw this. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So we don't come to prayer like the arrogant, self-serving, entitled, but we come to prayer with a spirit of humility in the posture of repentance 
and dependence on him. So let's go to prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, you call us in your word to cast our cares on you. We pray for members of this congregation that are in special need. You know who they are and what their needs are. We pray that you would show yourself sufficient, and when you do, turn our hearts to give you thanks. Pray silently now for those among us who are sick or sorrowful or hurting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you tell us in your word that we should pray for those in authority over us. And so we pray for our president and those who govern. Pray silently for those God has placed in positions of authority that they would act justly and walk humbly with our God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for churches around this nation, Lord, that you would place vital witnesses for the gospel in every community. Pray silently for faithful pastors, compassionate leaders, and visible love among believers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our students as they finish the school year, and especially for those who are graduating. Pray silently for those who are transitioning to new schools, cities, and jobs. Pray that they would know, rest, would know and rest in God's love, and that they would acknowledge him in all their decisions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's at this point in our service that we pause for a minute uh, just to remember how generous God has been to us uh, and to remember that uh, our church needs uh, resources in order to survive. And so uh, we want to encourage you to think about that as part of your worship with us, is to give to Christ the King. Uh, there are several ways to do that. You can give online, which is the way most people give. You can find out more information about that on the back of your bulletin. There's also an offering basket over here by the flowers on the way out if you'd like to give that way. Let's take a few moments now and just thank God for his kindness to us and ask him to make us cheerful givers. Let's pray. Father, um, it is so easy to just let the day fly by and not think about how much you give to us. It is so easy to move from the perspective of living under your kindness and provision to thinking that we handle everything on our own. So we ask that um, this would be a time in this service where you would bend our hearts to be generous, we pray, Lord, that you would bend us to see your goodness, your kindness, your generosity to us, uh, that we may be cheerful to give us to you. So please take what uh, people give here, and we pray that you would use it, uh, that people would abide in you, and that your gospel would go forth. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Good afternoon. Today's sermon passage is from Colossians 3, beginning in verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. infancy here in the beginning, uh, we've been preaching a series on prayer. 
Because we don't see how people can connect with God if they don't pray. And so um, we're at the tail end of that uh, series. We've only got three more sermons left in it. And what we've been looking at recently are ways to pray. We've been using the old acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, to uh, pass on to you some of the ways that the Bible teaches us how to pray. A is for adoration, which means making much of God. Uh, C is confession, which means confessing our sin and our limitations to God and asking him for his help. T is for thanksgiving, which means telling God um, how thankful and grateful we are for what he's done for us. And then S is supplication, which means praying for other people, and particularly the world. And so today we're, going, we're on the second part of uh, the T for Thanksgiving. Uh, we've been looking at this passage from Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we started last week and we're going to continue it this week. And then the next two weeks we're going to look at supplication. Uh, next week we're going to look at how to pray for the church. And then the last week we're going to look at how to pray for the world. So that's where we are in things. Um, so last week we started in Colossians 3. And I want to catch you up for those of you that weren't here um, the passage that was read to you earlier from Colossians chapter 3 um, is, is in this letter that Paul wrote to Colossae. And one of the major themes in the book is how God is relating to us as his people. And that, that relationship is best described as a marriage. As uh, this connection between God, a union, is what uh, Steve talked about as the relationship earlier. And um, we parachute in in chapter 3... And it's in just these three verses, it's describing how this relationship between God and his people, um, over time as they relate to one another and grow, that something changes about our character. And the character of that relationship becomes more and more clear. And to simply put the character, it looks like this. Jesus is generous. And we, the church, or his people, are grateful. And what you're going to see as we talk about this, just as we looked at it last week, is that the fall has really ruined this dynamic between us and Jesus. To where we don't live, we don't live in this state of being grateful for life. Instead, we think we've earned life. We think that we deserve certain things. We, we become entitled to certain things. And what Jesus has done is, is by marrying us, by having this relationship with us, he's undoing that. So that over time, we're changing and we're becoming more grateful people, more thankful people as we live. And what we've seen in this passage is it demonstrates that uh, Jesus gives us gifts, kind gifts. And our response to those kind gifts is to be grateful, is to be thankful. We see it in each verse. Last week, we looked at the first verse where it talked about Jesus giving us the gift of peace that comes through him. And uh, which means this ability to relax in his grace uh, even when our circumstances are difficult. Um, but that this peace only comes as we draw near to him. Only as that marriage is, as, as we grow in intimacy in that marriage, does that peace come. And so it's receiving gifts like this from Jesus that shapes our hearts to be thankful again, to be grateful again. Um, we ended last week by talking about Thanksgiving, just a little quick uh, overview of what it means to be thankful. And we talked about how there's a difference between being grateful and being thankful. All right, I want to go over that one more time with you. Gratefulness is an inner disposition uh, where we realize that our gratitude is this inner disposition in us where we realize that we are, are thankful for things that have happened outside. Okay, that, that we are endeared to something outside of us because of, um, of this giver that has given us something. But thanksgiving is different from gratitude. Gratitude is an inner disposition, thankful for the giver giving us a gift. But thanksgiving is actually telling the giver thanks. A vocalization of the inner disposition. So there's a sense in which this can go wrong in a couple of ways. We ended this week, last week, talking about the ways it can go wrong. One way it can go wrong is that you can be grateful for things but never tell anybody. And when you do that, we call that thanksgiving. That you're keeping the thanks rather than telling. And like what it does is it prevents this flood of encouragement to go out to people that desperately need it in their lives, right? And the other way that we can screw this up is uh, by not really being grateful but thanking people. In other words, we're lying. You, this happens with your kids all the time, right? Uh, you know, where you tell them you need to say thank you and they're like, thank you. But there's no gratitude. 
in their heart, right? And so these things can go bad in us. And we ended last week at the very end of uh, verse 15. And uh, we came to this conclusion. And the conclusion is simply this. If thanksgiving is voicing our gratitude, telling someone that you're thankful for what they're doing, that we can't be thankful to God unless we pray. Does that make sense? We can't be thankful to God unless we tell him what we're thankful for. And yet so often in our lives, we hold back and don't tell God that we're thankful. So in view of that, the sermon today is going to be a little different than normal. I'd like to practice what we preach as we go today. And so um, before we jump into the, the last two verses, I want to stop and I want us to just pray for a minute. And I want you to think about something. I want you to think of one thing in your life right now that you're thankful for. Okay? I don't know what it is. It could be a person. It could be that school's almost over. You know, it could be for an accomplishment, whatever it is. I want you to think of one thing that you're thankful for right now. All right? And we're going to take 30 seconds and I'm going to let you thank God for it in your heart. Okay? And then I'll close this. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for these gifts. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, I've got a couple of gifts that people have given me that I want to show you today. The first is this gift that was given to me a number of years ago by one of my children, maybe my wife. It's a coffee mug. And it just says, Fa 4, T-H-O-R, like the, you know, the Avenger. And it says, like a dad, just way mightier. Uh, see also handsome or exceptional, okay? Now, uh, what's interesting about this gift is, uh, is that it was in the way back of the cabinet. We had to go fish it out and find it today because it's just not a gift that, uh, I mean, I was, I'm happy for it, but it just didn't, you know, it's not one of those things that just grips you, right? But this is another gift. Two Christmases ago, my, my wife gave me this. This is a piece of art that we found, uh, and this was done by a nun in Iowa, I think, at some, at some convent, and it's a picture of Mary comforting Eve, okay? And I, this really gripped me. I thought this was such an encouraging thing, so much so that, like, if you've been over to my house, I've probably shown it to you when you came over. So a lot of you are nodding your heads, right? Because it's a gift that really made an impression on me. I'm super thankful for it, and so I talk about it whenever people come over. I want to show it to people. I want people to see what it's like and that sort of stuff. And so in in view of that, sometimes we don't think about gifts. uh, It's only the gifts that are the most impressive to us, right, that we want to talk about, that we want to share to other people, that we really feel this deep, deep thankfulness for. And so my hope today is really simple, is I want to look at two gifts that Jesus gives you, that he talks about in this passage, and my hope is just in talking about them, you'll want to thank God for them. Because I think that's the whole point, is that, is that Jesus comes into this relationship with you, and he gives you things all the time in your life. And as you receive them, my hope is that, in his hope, is that he begins to sort of reverse the curse. And instead of living as sort of these entitled, self-dependent people, we begin to live as thankful, dependent people in our lives. So let's look at these two gifts that Jesus is going to offer us in the passage today and hope that God will turn our hearts a little bit and begin to move us toward uh, thanksgiving. The first one is his word. All right, we see this uh, in verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Um, here Paul is describing what he calls the word of Christ. The word is both the person and work in Jesus, as well as what we would call the words that Jesus has spoken. But the word of God is what this is describing. It's how the Bible tells the story of Jesus from the beginning to the end. And Paul says this. He says, let his, this word dwell in you richly. Right, this is fascinating language. The idea here is that the word is being brought inside of you, that it's becoming part of you, that it's shaping you, it's making you into a a really a different thing as it becomes part of your makeup. 
I want to give you five, four ways that someone, uh, someone, another pastor wrote about these things that I think is helpful to think about what it means for these, these, this word of God to become part of you, to dwell in you. Um, one, and these are all sort of biblical notions about the word of God and what it means for us to let it dwell in us richly. The first is um, to heed it. You know what that word means, to heed the word of God? It really simply means to pay attention to it. Um, I think about the lines on the road, you know. Um, those lines are meant to keep you between them so that you're safe, so that your car is safe, so that you don't injure other people, so that uh, you flourish when you drive, right? And the Word of God is what we call our rule of faith and practice. It's the lines that keep us within our design. It keeps us in a healthy, wise place to live our lives. And so the Bible is something that we should heed like those lines. We have to know it. We have to understand it. We have to uh, pay attention to it in order uh, to to stay within our design. Our temptation is going to be to veer off into danger in our lives. A second word uh, about how we let this become part of our, let this dwell in us richly, is to handle it. We hear this language in the Bible sometimes, to handle the Word of God. Uh, And this means uh, to engage with it. Uh, to, uh, to care for it, like a, like a precious relationship or something like that. The Word of God matters to you. This is when I ask you the question, like, do you read the Bible, right? Or does the, is, is the Bible something that you care about, that you want in your life? How often do you read it? How often do you hear people teach on the Bible? How often are you in small groups that talk about the Bible? If it's this transformational Word of God that goes out in our lives and makes us different— how, how are you handling it? How, are, are you availing yourself to it? There's a, a funny old story about this Baptist minister <clears throat> that I read once. Um, and he went over to visit a congregant. And uh, he was, the congregant kind of was wayward. He was not going to church anymore, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he walks over and picks up, the, he sees the Bible laying in the guy's house. And he picks it up on a table and he <laughs> blows the dust off of it. And he says, I do believe there's so much dust on this Bible, I could write the word damnation on it. (laughs) It's a terrible joke. Um, But that's the idea. Like, are are we willing to keep this in our hands? You know, Uh, there's the old story of Billy Graham who used to leave the Bible open in his house where he would walk by and see it, right? So he would would be forced to engage with it as he walked around his home. Um, A third way, hiding the word in your heart. Okay, have you ever heard that language before? Hide the word of God in your heart. This means to keep it close to you, to make it part of ourselves. I used to have a, I had a, a college professor that taught Christianity, and he would often talk about the Bible, and he would, he would describe it as a lozenge. It's a really, you know what a lozenge is? Like a cough drop you put on the back of your throat, and it slowly dissolves so that your throat stops hurting. It cures your, it begins to uh, cure your maladies. And he says that, he, that the Word of God is meant to be that way where we, 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 we let it slowly become part of us. We let it dissolve into our lives as we make ourselves available to it. I had a seminary professor who, would, who wrote commentaries all the time. And he would often in our classes, he was uh, teaching about the Bible, he would stop and he would just look at the verse and he would go, uh, you know, I, um, I need to let this live in me a little bit longer before I talk about it. I really, need to, I really need to meditate on this passage for another two or three weeks before I feel comfortable talking about it. You know, that sort of idea is that we're hiding. The word is, is becoming part of who we are. It's, it's shaping us as a person. And then the last one is to hold the word of God out to other people. And that we share the goodness of God's word to other people. It's, it's a story about uh, this great good news that's radically changed your life as a person, and we want other people to know about it. And so we want to engage them with the word. <clears throat> um, I, 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 as I was thinking about this, a number of you, when we, we were in the infancy stages of the church plant and we were talking to folks about being involved with the church plant, uh, you would come over to my house and Caitlin would make cookies. And she makes these really dynamite cookies. They're awesome. And some of you said you stayed because of the cookies. I remember this. But they're so good, and, like, people are still talking about them. And it's that sort of idea that, like, uh, the Word of God has this, uh, this delightfulness to it that we want to tell people about it. 
how it's shaped you over in your life, how it's changed you, how it's moved you from being one sort of person into another person, how it's opened your eyes to being a clean person, to being a forgiven person. Uh, all these things are so important. It's, it's something that we want to share with other people. And, and, and just to, this is an easy way as you're talking to non-Christians about, the, about God. Oftentimes we think we have to sort of be uh, real savants of you know, talking people in, into what we want them to understand. But oftentimes it just means talking about something that mattered to you and that shaped you in your life. And the Word of God is a great place to just say, hey, let's read this together and talk about it. All that moves us to the point where he talks about giving thanks. We see this in the second part of the verse where he says, uh, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now notice this. Paul describes the right response to God's word as sort of a party. Um, He says that receiving this gift from Jesus should propel us to share it with people, uh, to sing about it in like three different ways, uh, for our hearts to be filled up with gratitude for it in the way that we live. Um, It's sort of this response of like hearing something really fabulous. Like if you heard today, somebody found a cure for cancer. You would tell everybody you knew, right? And that's, the word of God is the story of the rescue of humanity from their sin, right? It should, it should compel us to want to share that with other people, to deeply compel, deeply compel us to want to have a, a party-like attitude about it. But something else the word of God does that's fascinating is it shows us why we don't want to be grateful, it opens, it, it explains why our hearts are the way they are. I want to think about this just for a second. I, I owe th- this conversation to a lecture that I talked a little bit last week by a guy named Ben Keyes on Thanksgiving. That's very helpful, and I'll be glad to pass it on to any of you. But one of the things that uh, Keyes talks about when it comes to gratitude and Thanksgiving is that from the beginning, since the fall in Genesis chapter 3, our tendency has been to think of God more as a withholder than a giver. All right, think about this. Satan comes and tempts Adam and Eve in the garden. And this is what he says to them. Did God tell you not to eat from any tree in the garden? You see what he's doing? Any tree. Of course, Eve responds and says, no, no, no. He says we can eat from any tree, just not the one in the center of the garden. Right? If we eat of it, then we're going to die. And then Satan says to her, you will not die. If you eat of it. For God knows that if you do, you'll become like him and your eyes will be opened and you'll know good and evil. So you see what he's doing? What Satan has done, the very first temptation of humanity is to tempt them to believe that God is withholding goodness from them. Right? He, he's a withholder. He's not a giver, he's a withholder. <clears throat> and at this moment, Adam and Eve become obsessed with the one prohibition in the garden, when there's this enormous creation full of gifts that God has given them to have any of them they want, but they become obsessed with the one thing that they're told that they can't do. And they question God's character from that point forward, right? God is not really a giver. Maybe he doesn't want the best for me. Maybe he's withholding from me. And what that does is it creates a grid by which we think about the world. So think about it this way. Um, you lose your job. How are you going to think about that? Are you going to think about it through the grid that God is a giver or that God is a withholder? You have a miscarriage. How are you going to think about that? Through the grid of God being a giver or through the grid of God being a withholder? Um, You deal with difficult issues with your family. How are you going to view that? As God being a giver or as God being a withholder? You see, the fall has disposed us to move and think of God as this one who is not going to give good things to us. He doesn't care about us like we think he's going to care about us. So this is one reason that the word of God is given to us as people, as a gift. To remind us of the story of God's generosity and to reshape us to being people of gratitude. To reverse that curse. And it challenges our natural bent to believe that God is withholding from us by revealing the story 
that he sends Jesus, that he is the most generous of all beings because he sent his only son. He gave his only son so that you could have peace with him. You see, the whole point of the word of God is to show you God's generosity, to reverse that way of thinking in your mind. And he wants us to believe this together. Uh, You know, it, it, it goes without saying that everything is plural in here. Teaching and admonishing one another, right? That's the idea. We have to share this with each other because our temptation is going to be when you suffer or when I suffer, we're going to believe that God's a withholder. And we have to remind one another, no, he's a giver. He's a giver. He gave more than you could ever give in the life of his son. Teaching and admonishing one another in that way. Um, I read a quote recently by a man named James K. Smith where he says this about his own doubts. He says, some days I show up at church with my doubts and I'm counting on you, my friends, to sing for me. Right? We need each other to believe this and to not fall into the trap of seeing God as a withholder. Quickly, the second gift that Jesus gives us, this is a little bit quicker, is he gives us his name. We see in verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Jesus Christ. The name of the Lord conveys a rich meaning here. It provides us with several different important perspectives on what it means to take on somebody else's name, right? I'm going to give you three very quickly. One is his character. You know, the name of God in the Bible is synonymous with this character. You know, I'm Buck, but that really doesn't describe what I'm like. But the names of God all describe what he's like. There are things like he is the father, the master, the comforter, uh, the one who provides, the sustainer, uh, our shield and defender, the redeemer, the shepherd, the deliverer, the lover, the friend, the holy one, the prince of peace, the zealous one, the jealous one. All these describe God's character, what he's like on the inside. And what it does is when we take on that name, when we live in that name and we do everything that we do in, the na- in that name, it allows us to, to begin to be shaped to be like him. Like our, our whole attitude is to become like the name that we carry, which is the name of Jesus Christ. I, we want to mirror his generosity and character to a world who does not see it. And that is part of what Jesus came to do, not just to forgive us our sins, but form us into people who can mirror him to the world that they can see and know him. A second aspect of this is that the, the name means a family name. Right? We're Christians. We bear the name of Christ. Living in the name of God means that uh, we bear his family name. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. We've married him. Those, all these analogies that the Bible uses to describe our relationship with God, many of them are family analogies. That, that's what we have his name. We wear, I don't just name, wear the name tag Buck Rogers. I wear Buck Rogers, child of the living God. Right? Um, this is who we are. It means that we belong. We have a group that we belong to. That we have an identity outside of just the silly things that the world wants us to identify ourselves by. And then the last thing is this, is that uh, it, it's a name of power. Doing things in the name of Jesus Christ is a name of power. In that name, demons are cast out. Sick are healed. Prayers are made. Living in the name of Jesus means that the impossible can be possible. And he said... You have my name. Do everything in my name. I'm giving you power, spiritual power in this world. So we give thanks. And it ends by saying this, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The last lesson we learned about Thanksgiving in this passage is that it's a gift, right? We are thankful through him, that is through Jesus. It is Jesus' work in us that shifts our hearts away from pride to seeing God as the giver of all good things. And without this change of heart, we just won't be grateful. We're not going to be grateful people without the work of Jesus in our lives. And so we arrive right back where we started, which is if you want to be grateful people, if you want to be people who are truly thankful for your life, you got to get near Jesus. That's where it's found. Abiding in Jesus, connecting with God is the way those things are formed and shaped in our lives. I want to pause for just a minute and, and just ask you, as you think, have you thought about these things? Have you thought about what it means to be shaped into people who are thankful? As you think about God's word, as you think about his name, I want to just pause for a minute and ask you to pray and thank him.
I want to keep putting practice into this. Let's take 15, 20 seconds and pray and thank God for his word, however that may have been at work in your life, and for his name and him giving you this family name and inviting you into his family. Let's pray for just a minute. Jesus, thank you for these gifts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to close with just two uh, general points of application for you to think about in terms of praying thanksgiving in your life. Okay? Just two things that I want you to consider. The first is this. Is that gratitude must be cultivated in your life. Uh, developing a, a healthy heart of thanksgiving is like planting a garden. Okay? It takes patience. It takes dependence on God. You don't just make the garden grow on your own. And it takes healthy patterns and habits, doing the right thing, treating the soil the right way. And so the place to begin for all this, if you want gratitude to be part of your life, is prayer. Like we said before, that's the way. That's the place to start. Considering God's gifts and giving thanks for them will begin to shape our hearts and minds toward the reality of him being a giver rather than us just living lives that we make on our own. Another way to think about this, of creating sort of a cultivating a pattern of gratitude in your life, is to thank other people for what they've done for you. I dare say everyone in this room could probably thank almost everyone in this room that you know for something that they've done for you in your life. But you probably haven't. You let the gratitude sit here and you don't let it out. And I think a healthy pattern for us as a church is to become people who thank each other for what you've done. Thank your parents. Kids, thank your parents. Do you realize all they do for you? It's rather incredible how much they do for you. And parents, thank your children uh, for, for trying to comply with our bevy of rules, right? For trying to live life under our authority. <laughs> thank them for, for, for their work and the way that they, they live their lives. Thank them for being good students and for trying hard in school. Um, thank your spouse for what they do for you. Tell them what they mean to you. Give thanksgiving to each other. As you begin to do that, you'll see more and more. Uh, you'll begin to notice things that you didn't notice before. Start small and build this into your life. Maybe begin each day by writing down one way that you're thankful for another person and one way that you're thankful to God in particular. Just write it down. Um, it will be transformative to you, I think, if you were just to do that over time to begin to think about how God has provided for you in various ways in your life. So that's the first thing. This is something that has to be cultivated in your life. The second thing is this. is to pay attention to God's cues of thanksgiving in your life. Um, he's a giver. And so he's cueing you in your life to ways that you should be grateful, that you maybe don't even notice. They can be joys, really exciting things, but they can also be pains, hard things in your life that make you thankful for what you had or what you will have in the future. Don't waste moments like this. There are times that Jesus is drawing you into his life and to connection with him by revealing his gifts to you in his life. Someone encouraging you, for example. Or a friend visiting you or praying for you when you're down. Your parents helping you. Your kids helping you. A quiet moment in your car when things aren't loud. A beautiful day outside. Maybe when it's really raining and the pollen washes away. Even suffering. This is one of the things that marks Christians as very different from anyone else, is that we can look at our sufferings and be thankful for them. Even in strange ways. I'll close by telling you a story about something that happened to me. I guess it was a little less than a year ago. We bought this house, um, and it has this big uh, porch on the back end. And I have one of these big green eggs type of things, although it's a knockoff. But anyway, it's a big egg thing. And uh, we had some friends over. I think it was for Thanksgiving. Maybe it was Christmas. But anyway, we went outside and I cooked a turkey on it, which is maybe the best thing you can cook on an egg. 
Shackelford and I can disagree on this later. But anyway, we, 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 we put a turkey on the egg about, I think I started at like 10 o'clock in the morning. You smoke it for like three hours. It's ready for lunch. You take it off. You dampen everything. And you kind of close the egg up and then you come inside. And we all eat turkey. And it was awesome. It was really fun. And, uh, and then our visitors kind of hung around for a while. And then some of them left and went home. And others went home. And so we all went to sleep that night. And uh, Caitlin was pregnant with Henry. And she had a contraction in the middle of the night that woke her up. And she woke up and looked out the window. And it, the grill was on fire. And, and she's like, Buck, wake up. The porch is on fire. And I'm like, what? And so I run and look. And like the, the grill has burned through the wooden stand that it's in. And it's burnt down into the porch. And it's burnt a hole and it's going through the porch. Okay, And there's flames like coming up outside. So I run outside, we try to put it out, we end up getting the water hose and we're able to put it out without the fire department coming over. <sighs> and uh, finally get it all put out, it scared us to death. But as I've thought back over the year, I can't think of a time that I'm more thankful. That she had a contraction, <laughs> you know? Henry may have saved our lives. We, we have a friend that's a fireman that basically came over and looked at it afterwards and he was like, if you would not have woke up, this might have killed y'all. You know, if it would have caught onto the side of the house, it would have might have killed you guys. So even in, like, uh, times of great difficulty, uh, there are things that we can be thankful for. This is why Paul said that, you know, even in his greatest sufferings, he could still be thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ. So my prayer today is that as you think about these things, um, that God would begin to reverse what's going on inside of you, inside of us, that we would be a community that's grateful rather than a community that thinks more highly of ourselves, that we have to handle everything, that we're entitled, that, that we're self-made, but rather remember that we are uh, a people who have a God who gives great gifts, and we should praise him for that. So let's pray together. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for uh, the kind gift that it is to us to show us even our... Uh, our tendencies to see you as a withholder rather than a giver. We pray, Father, that you would help us even now as we come to the table to remember the links that you went to give us your son. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Uh, our place of profound gratitude uh, it reminds us each week that um, the things that we live for are fleeting. It causes us to crave for something real and good and true. And it is a table that really describes what God has given for us, right? He gave us his son. And so um, today, as we come to this table, I want to remind you that if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have a relationship with him, um, that instead of coming and taking these elements, that you instead wait and that you consider taking him as your Savior. Um, you can please come and talk to me about that if you have questions about that. But the Bible warns us that this is a family table and that if you're not part of the family, to wait until you are to take of it. But if you do know Jesus today, this is a way to come and see tangibly once again <laughs> of, of, of what we have to be thankful for, right? The, the great kindness that he has shown us in giving us his son. Um, those things being said, let me pray and ask God to come bless us as we pay. Father, we are grateful for uh, this meal. I pray now that you would lift up our hearts, uh, that we would uh, connect with you as we uh, take this bread and take this wine, that we would remember the life that was lived and the death that was died for us, and that we would um, feed on you in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples, and he took bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We come not because we are strong, but because we are weak. We come not because we are whole, but because we are broken. We come not because we are righteous, but because we are repentant. 
We come not because we ought, but because we may. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and receive them, remembering that Jesus died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith. Um, our custom is that uh, you can come forward and there's this double stack cup in here. On the bottom is a cracker on one cup. On the top is the wine. Grape juice is in the center. We have three stations here. You can come to any of them that you would like. Um, and uh, our custom here is to hold the elements. Go back to your seat and hold the elements until um, and receive them all together at the end. So if you'll come, let us feast with the king. For the bread which you have broken, for the wine which you have poured, for the words which you have spoken. This promise that you love us by your gift of peace restored by your call to heaven above us hallow all our lives in the world to which you say This is the body of Christ given for you. Take, eat, remember, believe. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, remember, believe. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for your kindness to give us this meal. Thank you for reminding us that Jesus, you are here, that you are real, that you care for us and your love for us is more significant and profound than we know. Help us to trust in that today and to worship you as we leave. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It said that uh, as the disciples departed, they sang a hymn. So please, let's stand and sing together.
we are not consumed by the fire gathered up we will feast in the house of sight we will sing with our hearts from the Lord as we depart. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And all the king's people said, amen. Two things. One is, please uh, grab a drink on your way out. Let's fellowship and hang out for a bit. Second thing is, you don't have to rack the chairs this week. Uh, they're going to use them for something afterwards, so just enjoy. <laughs>